congregation is invited to rise. We continue on today with our celebration of this Advent season, this being the final Sunday in Advent. And today we hear this promise given to David that one of his descendants would reign on the throne forever. And we look at how God fulfilled that uh, in uh, sending Jesus. Today we'll follow Divine Service Setting 1 on page 151. And you're reminded that the hymn of praise uh, is omitted during this season of Advent. Page 151. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you of all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you of all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to turn to the insert in your bulletin where you'll find our introit for today comes to us today from Psalm 19 primarily. We read it responsibly. Shower, O heavens, from above, and let the clouds rain down righteousness. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber. Its rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Shower, O heavens, from above, and let the clouds rain down righteousness. Continue with the Kyrie, page 152. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord 
Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come and help us by your might, that the sins which weigh us down may be quickly lifted by your grace and mercy. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You're invited to be seated for our readings. The Old Testament reading for the fourth Sunday in Advent is from 2 Samuel, chapter 7. Now when the king lived in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, Go do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. But that same night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, Would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I have been moving around in a tent for my dwelling. In all places where I have moved with all the people of Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth, And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them, so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly, from the time that I appointed judges over my people. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from Romans chapter 16. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but now has been disclosed, And through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations, according to the command of the eternal God, to bring about the obedience of faith. To the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We rise and sing the Alleluia verse. Alleluia, Lord, to whom shall you go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia, Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the first chapter. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. For you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High. 
And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. This is the gospel of the Lord. You're invited then to be seated for our sermon hymn. Our sermon hymn is 357, 357.
The text uh, calls for our attention this Lord's Day is both our Old Testament reading and our Gospel reading, and particularly these verses from the Gospel reading where it is said this, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord will give him the throne of his father David. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. We've talked about this before. What? Well, the fact that us Americans don't much like the idea of having a king. Now, the people of old, God's people of old, certainly were not like us in that regard. They wanted a king. In fact, they begged and pleaded with Samuel to ask God to give them a king. Now, when we hear them ask for a king, we might want to go and tell them that they don't even know what they are asking for. We might want to tell them that they should understand that even if a king gives them something, he'll likely take something else away. But we didn't need to be there to tell them that because... God himself actually told them those told them those things right when they asked. Yes, in doing so, God revealed that their request for a king was short-sighted even just by earthly standards. But even worse than that, God said that it was gravely sinful. Yes, it wasn't just an unwise or blissfully ignorant desire, but it was sinful for two particular reasons reasons. First, the Israelites showed by this request that they wanted to be like all the other nations. They had forgotten the uniqueness that God had given them when he set them apart as his people. And secondly, they had forgotten that they already had a king, a king whose throne sat high above all the others and whose reign was far better than any earthly king. But yet they wanted a king. And God gave in and gave the people a king. After all, God was quite used to ruling people indirectly through other people. For instance, he was also the Israelites' heavenly father. And yet in the home, he used earthly fathers to fulfill many responsibilities. And so while he was not pleased with the request due to the sinful desires behind it, From that point forward, he did decide that he would rule over his people through a human king. And so God gave them a king. They gave him a king that looked like a king, one that was tall, one that had military victories, one who just was a king, it seemed, Saul by name. And Saul, he started off ruling well. He remembered who the true king was, But by the end of his reign, he had largely forgotten. And because of that, God said that he would not allow his son to reign after him. No, Jonathan would not be the next king. Instead, Jonathan's best friend David would be the next king. Yes, there would be no dynasty for King Saul's family. No one would speak in the future about the house of Saul. No, it was a one and done kind of thing. But for David, it would be different. In our text for today, it is revealed that David had some plans of his own while he was king, but God had other plans. David wanted to build God a house of worship, for he had a palace in which he lived, and yet God was still being worshipped in the tabernacle which was a holy place to be sure, and yet though still just a tent. He thought it rather sacrilegious that the king on earth should have a better house than the heavenly king would have. And I suppose in one way, he was absolutely right, that to the eye, that seemed quite wrong. But God didn't care about such things. No, indeed, he had building plans of his own. He was going to build David a house, not a house of cedar. David already had one of those. He was going to build him a house like I mentioned in regards to Saul moments ago. David's family would be a dynasty. 
It would not be one and done. In fact, God promised something quite magnificent to David, that one of his descendants would rule on the throne forever. He said, moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. And that promise of God, that one of David's descendants would always sit on the throne, well, that endured even when the faithfulness of kings and God's people faltered time and time again. David himself fell into grave sin, and his descendants did the same. And yet God's promise endured. In fact, there are many places in the book of Kings where we are told that God did not destroy his people solely because he had made this promise to David. And so he kept it. Yes, despite all the sins of the Davidic kings, and there were many, God continued to keep his word. This happened time and time again, king after king, throughout all the decades, first in the United Kingdom and later in the southern kingdom of Judah. Yes, it was true that there was a Davidic king sitting on the throne all the way until one day when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up to Jerusalem and laid siege to the city. Then Jehoiachin, the Davidic king at that point, well, he surrendered. And he was taken prisoner. All the treasures of his house and all the treasures of the Lord's house were taken away with him into Babylon. Yes, at that moment, the Davidic king sat in prison in Babylon. And that was very problematic. I mean, I'm sure it was problematic to Jehoiachin, who was sitting in prison. It was problematic to the people of Judah, who wondered what would come next. But even more so, it was problematic for the promises of God. How could this be when God had promised that one would rule on the throne forever that was a descendant of David? Quite frankly, if everything I had mentioned today was just about the kings of Israel, I probably wouldn't even be talking about it today. For in one way, we don't really have a stake in who is king of Israel in the Old Testament. But you know what we do have a promise or a stake in? Whether God's promises endure or not. And that's exactly what was at stake at that time when Jehoiachin went into exile in Babylon. For when the book of 2 Kings ends, everything is in question. The southern kingdom has been exiled. The city and the temple are destroyed. The Davidic king sits in prison in Babylon, reigning over absolutely nothing. So what of God's promise? Well, interestingly, the final, final thing we get in the book of 2 Kings is a little story that you almost wonder why it's there at first. We're told that that Davidic king, Jehoiachin, who was in prison, was all of a sudden given a seat at the king's table there in Babylon, and that he was given a small allowance to manage. Well, it's not much, it's not the restoration of the kingdom. It's not even the full restoration of the Davidic king. But it sure does seem like it's God's way of hinting and reminding that this whole thing about the Davidic king ruling forever, that story was not over. And it had better not be. Because if that story's over, then God's word simply is not true. For he had promised that one from David's line would rule over the throne forever. And if that word of God is not true, well then how do we know any of the others are true either? But his word was true. We heard about it in our gospel reading today. 600 years or so after those events with Jehoiachin, we are told that the angel Gabriel was sent from God to Galilee, to that city of Nazareth, to that virgin who was betrothed of a man named Joseph, who was of the house of, oh yes, David. And this is what he said to Mary about the child she would conceive and bear. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will rule over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Yes, that Davidic king, last seen having a lowly place at the table of the Babylonian king, would now once again sit at the head of the table again. 
He would rule over His people in grace and mercy, forgiving their sins. They would serve Him in everlasting righteousness and innocence and blessedness. Yes, with this announcement of Gabriel and its fulfillment nine months later, God's Word, which seemingly had been cast into doubt for six centuries, was all of a sudden proven to be what it always was, absolutely faithful. I know some of you will hear this sermon today and think that it's not all that relevant to you. But if you say that the promises of God are the things in which you have faith, and that they are the things to which you anchor your hope, well then you should be very interested in all of this. For every word that God speaks could, if he did not keep it, cast our whole faith into question. But every word of God that he does speak, and then he keeps, well, it bolsters our faith immensely. Do you believe that God will take care of you in your life, body, and soul? Why do you believe it? Well, because the word of God says so. He's promised to do it. Do you believe God will forgive your sins when you hear his word, when you receive his absolution, when you come today to his table? Why do you believe it? Well, because the word of God says so. He has promised it. Do you believe that one day when he returns, you will be judged righteous? Not based on your own actions, but because of what Jesus did at the cross and the tomb. Why do you believe it? Well, because God's word says so. His word tells you his promise has made it ring in your ears. God spoke a promise a long time ago to David. He promised that one of his descendants would sit on the throne of God forever. Gabriel not only told Mary that she would conceive and bear a son, but that in conceiving and bearing that son, this promise of God would be fulfilled after so many years in question. The Davidic king was there. The Davidic king would live in a manger, then he would hang on a cross, and then he would finally ascend back to his rightful throne. Because God kept this important word, you can trust every other word of God as well. He will take care of you. Today, here, your sins are forgiven. And yes, one day soon, he is coming to get you. What else do you need to know? Amen. You're invited then to rise. Then indeed, may God fill our heart with confidence in his promises. We ask this in Christ's holy name. Amen. Then at this time, we will confess our common faith together. We do so today in the words of the Nicene Creed, which you can find on page 158 in your hymnal. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God. He will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. 
I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection and the life of the world to come. Amen. We then go to our Lord with our prayers. Besides those we have been praying for, we also remember today Wayne and Carol Parson, uh, who worshiped with us here regularly at Peace. Uh, their daughter, uh, Julie, uh, suddenly died this week, and so we pray for them as they mourn. Let us then pray. O Most High, you have favored us in the incarnation of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of Mary. In everything, let it be to us according to your word. Give us faith to believe that nothing is impossible with you, and so to pray boldly in childlike confidence. Lord, in your mercy. O Most High, you have revealed in Christ Jesus the mystery kept secret for long ages, now made known to all nations through the prophetic and apostolic scriptures. According to your eternal command, give us faithful preachers of your gospel to bring about the obedience of faith. Strengthen your holy church in every place, Lord, in your mercy. Most high God, hear our prayers on behalf of our nation, its president, all legislators and judges. Preserve their lives and guide their actions for the good of all people. Give peace among the nations of the earth and preserve us from pestilence and famine, war and bloodshed, sedition, rebellion, and every evil. Lord, in your mercy. O Most High, grant all women with children and all mothers with infant children increasing happiness in their blessings. Look with compassion on the needy, the depressed, and the despairing. You grant healing to the sick and the recovering especially Pamela Berge, Peggy Harris, Tom Kosky, Elaine Stieg, Sharon Mosbeck, Christine Fierro, Shirley Turrell, and Steve Martin. Give peace to the anxious and the dying. Comfort all those who mourn, especially Wayne and Carol. And give them your hope in the resurrection. Lord, in your mercy. O Most High God, grant that all who receive your Son's body and blood this day may do so in repentance and faith and in the unity of a true confession. Work in us this Christmas a love and desire for your sacrament. Lord, in your mercy. O Most High, we give you thanks for your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the key of David and the scepter of the house of Israel. By his death he has opened the kingdom of heaven and closed the gates of hell to all who trust in him. By his resurrection, he has rescued the prisoners who sat in darkness and in the shadow of death. Grant that as we recall with thanksgiving his advent into the flesh, we may always confess him and remain watchful for his advent in glory at the last day. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue at this time with the service of the sacrament, page 160. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and all places give thanks to you. Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, whose way John the Baptist prepared, proclaiming him the promised Messiah, the very Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, and calling all sinners to repentance, that they may escape from the wrath to be revealed when he comes again in glory. Therefore, with angels and with archangels and with all the company of heaven, 
We laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Holy Lord, God of power and might, far full of your glory, O Hosanna, O Hosanna, O Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, O Hosanna in the Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. It is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always.
We rise and sing, thank the Lord. Let us pray. We give thanks to Almighty God that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. We implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith towards you and in fervent love towards one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. We're seated for our final hymn, number 338. 338. Jesus, thy people free from all fears.
Glad to have everyone here today. A couple words of announcement uh, before we go today. Uh, the first is just to remind you, of course, this week is our Christmas Eve and Christmas Day service here at Peace. So Christmas Eve at 7 o'clock, our candlelight service, uh, 7 o'clock on Christmas Eve. And then on Christmas Day, we have our joint service with St. Paul's uh, that's hosted here at Peace. And that has Holy Communion, and that's at 10 o'clock. Uh, please also note that the newsletter deadline is this week, uh, and if you can try to get that in by Tuesday, uh, we would appreciate it this week due to the holidays. Um, also, uh, you're reminded that today uh, we will be caroling. Uh, we're just going to carol here through Finlayson. Uh, the girls yesterday went and put some flyers out along the route, so hopefully people will sort of be looking for us as we uh, go along throughout town. But we're going to meet at 2 o'clock here at church, or to try to leave at 2 o'clock, so a couple minutes before, and we'll head out uh, at 2 o'clock. So we hope uh, some of you, uh, even that didn't sign up, might uh, join us. We would love to have you uh, go with us for that. Um, anything else that needs to be announced in particular? I guess just that maybe the final thing today would be that when we come for Christmas Eve service, uh, you know, if you are already seeing a larger family group, right, for, uh, you know, in, in different settings or whatever right now, uh, we do ask that you would then kind of think ahead and say, okay, yeah, we're all going to sit in one pew, you know, if we've got a, a larger family group that could sit together, uh, they would sit all together in one pew and just help us a little bit with the, the spacing. Uh, I'm sure we'll have a, a you know, Know, quite a few people here and there through for that service but if you can do a little thinking ahead of how you can kind of group up with people you're already seeing uh, that'll help us on that night also uh, anything else then all right the lord bless your week